Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Shells to Call Home by Leah Gibbons As we pushed through the door, a wind chime banged the glass, tingling my skin with a shell symphony. The sea smell washed over me like a sweep of sound in a cathedral concert. That kind of thing gets inside you, in your nose and mouth, soaking your skin like your mother marinates chicken, so the flavors changed. You know you're taking it home with you. Hello! A warm voice rang out like a bell. I looked up. Colors shouted everywhere. I searched for the person amid walls of necklaces and overflowing countertops. A woman with thick braids sat at the back of the narrow room. We waited in the doorway. I watched the sunlight trickle down her face as she rose. Come in, she opened her hands. I don't bite, not even little children. Her voice was a song I just understood. I wanted to hear it again, to know why her English was not like my English, but so beautiful. My parents laughed and stepped inside. I inhaled. I was used to thinking a lot, but not talking. Could you tell me? I started quiet. Where you're from? Your accent, it's... My face got hot. I come from Jamaica. The woman walked towards us to make a better life. She chuckled. That life wasn't all bad. I miss it sometimes. I looked up at Grandpa. He has friends here, I thought, even if he feels alone. My mother says talk of Russia gives him pain, though, so I shouldn't ask. This is a nice place, she added. Beaches, the shells I love. Can I help you find some? Grandpa stepped up to a counter and dug his fingers in a box, each shell no bigger than his pinky nail. He lifted a few, then let them drift down, the lightest click-clack. You're all right. He motioned to the row. These are all from Florida? Yes, the woman smiled. I went over to him. My parents examined earrings in the next case. Find your favorite, he said. Maybe you can make a necklace. Each box held different shells, and the line of them seemed never-ending. Every shape, each shrunken as if only an ant could live in it. And the colors, a pink castle for a girl ant, a green horn-shaped house. Did they paint these, I whispered to Grandpa. He shook his head. I think it's natural. Amazing, yes, all the little worlds. The sink of my heart got unstopped, and warmth rushed through. I felt closer to Grandpa than I had to anyone in a long time. He understood. He understood small things like me. Tiny things, finding their way in big oceans. I don't think I can pick one, I said louder. They're all so different. He smiled. We could get a few of each, but that would make too long a necklace. That's okay, I said. I don't really wear jewelry. A thought I shouldn't have spoken. Well, let's see. He put both elbows on the glass, rested his chin on his hands. How will you bring Florida home, then, to see and remember? My parents came over. Grandpa drew a finger down the long counter. We need to carry them all. The shopkeeper hadn't seemed to be listening, but she must have been. She pulled the jar from under the counter, thick glass with a metal top like the ones in our garage. I reached for it, and the glass cooled my hands. My fingers traveled over little speed bumps, words I couldn't make out. Perfect, Grandpa said. Now to create. I tiptoed against the counter for a better view and found what might have been my favorite if the others weren't. A funnel-shaped shell, woven and curved like the long, thick braid of hair I'd always wanted. I picked up a few of the hair curls and dropped them in the jar, watched them skitter across the bottom. Grandpa held spirals, brown and white stripes, winding ever tighter till an ant would need a magnifying glass. I nodded, and he pinged them in. The pile grew. A zebra's ridgeback slipped past, then a swirl of pink like strawberries and yogurt. Bigger ones, too. A shell shelf wedged between the jar's sides, balancing the small worlds. Lisa, I heard my father. Are you ready? Nobody's had lunch. I know I'm hungry. Strawberries and yogurt, I'd thought. Maybe that was my stomach talking. But there was still space for shells. Did he want the jar to leave starving? I held it up to show the emptiness. We'll figure out something. He tapped his fingers on the counter. Let's pay and get going. I looked to Grandpa. He stayed silent. 
Okay, the woman said as she walked toward the register. I'll weigh everything and check you out. She wrapped the jar in brown paper and handed it to me. Did you find some good ones? I nodded again. You can't put the beach in a jar, she said. But this will remind you. It does me. She swept an arm across the store. The world of colors, bright jackets, pinned flags, startled me once more. I could have been anywhere. Or nowhere special. It wasn't till we reached sunlight and sand I could relax. Dingy sand, broken by weeds and sidewalks, but still beach. One slow slope to the water. On our way to the car, I had an idea. I unwrapped the jar, unscrewed the lid. The shells had shifted, and I smoothed the pile. As everyone else walked ahead, I knelt and scooped a handful of the cleanest sand, then poured it into every crevice so the lid just fit. I would put the beach in a jar. I would try. Hello there. Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. One of the good and bad things about working in this short, short form that we do is you don't get a lot of backstory. You have to get the backstory from your characters by little tiny hints and clues in a story. And as I was reading the story we kicked off with, Leah Givens, uh, Shells to Call Home, I was torn between wanting more backstory. I want to know really what's going on with Lisa and her father. I want to know really why grandpa ended up in Florida and also being grateful that I didn't have it because my mind immediately filled in those blanks and created an entire elaborate backstory around Lisa and dad and grandpa that may or may not be true based on the writer's reality of this story. And so I was also kind of grateful that my version of the backstory gets to live in my head without being weighted down by the story. So it was an interesting push-pull going on in my mind. Today's episode kind of is about that lost feeling you get when you're traveling or when you're in some place completely new or completely different or completely foreign. You kind of get taken out of the everyday world and into a place that has its own time and its own space. And so There were a lot of titles that I considered for this episode, but that line from the story, anywhere or nowhere special, it just sums that feeling up perfectly. We are launching into National Poetry Month here on the podcast next up with a poem. I promised you when I announced this was happening that every episode will still contain stories. I know some people are really off put by poetry, but thought we could tease a little bit of it in there. And Stephanie Dickinson is doing our first poem. And I think a lot of people get put off by poetry because they feel like they have to analyze it. I know this was true when I would go, when I would share poetry with students when I was working in a school library, is there was this feeling that if you don't get out of it what you're told to in literature class, that you've somehow failed and done it wrong. And I think that's tragic because you don't have to have an advanced degree in literature to allow a poem to touch you or move you. You don't have to be able to analyze exactly what its linear structure is in order to have an experience of a poem. So when I talk about the poems on this and and future episodes, it's not about analysis. I might tell you a little bit of some of the literary things going on, but that's not what it's about. It's about having the experience of literature. And I think the poem we are starting out with is a great way to throw you into that because you do not have to analyze or know anything about this poem in order to feel it. It's very sensory. In fact, I think in some ways, trying to analyze it might take away from the richness of language that's coming. What I will tell you about it is it's a prose poem, which is a term I hadn't heard a year ago. So if it's new to you, it's new to me too. Prose poem as I understand it, and I am not an expert either, but prose poem as I understand it is it takes away the lines. So the lineation that a poem usually has that gives you those line breaks, it's just a paragraph of prose but it's designed to be a paragraph of prose that works in poetic language and poetic form. So it it has some meter in it, but it doesn't have that kind of meter that poems have. It has more of a meter within sentences and within, you know, the, the structure of prose. And I really, the line between flash fiction and prose poem is one that writers play with a lot. So I really wanted to include some prose poetry as we moved into sharing poems. And 
You may love this poem. You may hate this poem. Either of those things is okay, but I invite you to just let yourself have the sensory experience of hearing it because it, it's rich in that. Very, very rich in that. Um, and I thought long and hard about whether I should put it back to back with the story that's coming at the end because the story that's coming at the end is very, very prose. It's not, you know, I think there's poetry in all language, but it's not poetry in any traditional sense. And it starts out with a very different mood than you're in when you leave the poem. And so kind of struggle with, do I need to put some narration in the middle or something? But I love the mood change in the last story that's coming a cruise day. And I think putting it back to back with the poem really brings that into relief. The mood of the poem, the mood of the story changes so dramatically from the beginning to the end of it. And I think the last story more than any really exemplifies that lost feeling of traveling and of being away in a different space and time. So whether you love them or hate them back to back, I think hearing those two pieces is going to be an interesting experience. Speaking of love and hate, I'm so glad I had this nice segue. It's almost like I planned it. Um, we are getting ready to celebrate our birthday and 50th episode. And we are going to showcase some, po- some stories out of our archives as well as some listener feedback. And for that, we need all of you. So there is, right now, live on the website, noextrawords.wordpress.com, a survey that asks you to tell us what your favorite story is from our archives so we can see what you want us to showcase. Again, because this is such a matter of personal opinion, I'm really curious to know what you all think. And also gives you a chance to share your feedback. And that can be feedback about the show. It can be why you are drawn to or write or consume flash fiction or your experience of being a contributor if you're a past contributor, any of that, we'd love to just share your voices on the show. So visit our website, take the survey. I promise I'm not collecting email. We're not going to spam you. It's not any of that. It's just that we want you to participate in the putting together of our special birthday 50th episode. So I'm going to keep reminding you of that in the weeks coming. I promise the whole survey is going to take you like five minutes. I promise. So with that, I'm going to get you to the poem. I'm going to get you to the story. I hope you have a great week and we will be back with more Poetry Month fun next week on No Extra Words. You guys take care. Big Headed Anna Nurses Her Imaginary Baby At Night in the Bayou by Stephanie E. Dickinson Black Bayou I'm afraid of the night hunter, owls picking off mice and feral cats. I hear their cries and caterwauling as they are taken up and emptied of life. I have never had a friend. My baby will be my first. The sun sets and she wakes with the most heart-rending shriek, followed by her hum, a kind of bird call. Birds singing like they do straight through rain and thunder call to her, and she tries to answer. Slowly it grows pitch black, except for sparkling fireflies and misty yellow cloths. In the darkness the souls glow, they're always here, but without moonlight they shine, they carry what the slaves made their light with. I can see burning scarves bobbing in the water, light from grease lamps, an iron bowl filled with lard and a rag floating in it for flame. A long time ago a magnolia tree grew here and the blossoms opened, the scent is still so strong. A white room you can walk into and be gone, mosquitoes want to live in my hair and in my leaf-colored eyes. I grab the oars and row to the middle where no one will pester us. I don't remember picking my baby up, but she's in my arms and I press my nose to her head, inhaling the whiteness. Her suck is strong. I've never felt anything like this. If I had been standing, I would have fallen. I could feel it leaving my body. All the shiners and croakers, all the summer nights when I slept in the heat, all the milking of cows, the ladling of soup, all the everything flowing out of me into this hunger. My infant is soft as an egret nest, and I hold all her warmth against my chest. Around me, water skimmers breed, and spiders hunt with their nets, dragonflies court in midair, mites cling to hosts, a crawfish digests its old shell. Words catch on my teeth. I love you. There's just the two of us listening, but that's enough. I offer myself to be eaten.
Cruise Day by Mitchell Krokmalnik Gravois. 1. On the glass table near my cruise ship's cabin window, I lay out my 13 pills on top of a brochure for shore excursions. 13 pills. The number seems lucky. There's my antidepressant, the pill to lower my blood uric acid so I won't suffer from gout, the rich man's malady, my baby aspirin, my boner pill. As I swallow my 13, from the smallest to the largest, fish oil capsules, I notice a small disc on the tabletop about the size of my gout pill. It's blue with a black dot in the middle. In a moment, I recognize it. It is one of the discs that our cabin boy uses to make eyes for the animals he leaves perched on our bed every evening. Elephant, octopus, monkey. It's amazing what he can do with just a few twists of towel. I'm enamored by this disc free floating on the glass table. After I take my 13 pills, I flip it into the air like an M&M and capture it in my mouth. I swallow it dry and feel jubilant. 2. In the island church, in a niche where religious statues would normally stand, is a golden ship with black sails. Outside the church, a dreadlocked alcoholic is ranting to himself. Elsewhere in the Caribbean, my son and his wife are sailing their ramshackle boat. They mend the sails as they go. Their shih tzu is staying at my house. My neighbor is shoveling snow off my walk. He lost his job, so now he shovels snow for everyone. The Madonna holds a knitting needle. I hope she doesn't accidentally poke me in the eye. The pastor makes small talk, then asks for a donation. A black woman walks away from this church, the Cathedral of the Virgin of Guadalupe, the virgin whom I have followed from Sicily to Mexico and into the Caribbean. The black woman's back is muscular. It says to the virgin, I don't need you. I don't need help from anyone. I would like to wrestle her in an amateur match. Winner take all. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.